I tried the the intro already. Seems to work. Final final class, exciting. All right. That's good. Yeah, this is the last last class of this semester, actually, the CS480. I have one more on Friday for CS410. But for this this class, it's the last one. And I got my uh, second COVID shot yesterday, and I definitely feel sick, you know, so uh, definitely have fever, headache. Some people don't have anything, even in the second one. All right, let's start. We have a lot of stuff to cover today, actually. So let's start. Today is recap time. This is lecture 40 and the last lecture of the semester. Yes, the last lecture of the semester. Exciting and sad. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Assignment seven, thank you for the submissions. Um, yeah, I'll grade this very soon and this will go. Oh, I got a lot of emails regarding grades, missing grades and so on. Don't worry, you know, everything will be up to date. Everything will be, um, as far as I, I'll try to make it correct, you know, if there are any problems later on, so I probably uh, this weekend will have all the grades in there. People are concerned about the journal club. Whoever did presentations at the journal club will get the full points. I mean, those were good presentations. All right. So assignment seven was submitted. Mega quiz is now in Blackboard and online. So remember, it counts as four quizzes bonus only. So you can only win if you take it. So please go ahead. Don't forget to do the evals cs480.org slash evals, please. That's very important, especially if um, uh, I'm, I will, they decide if I can teach this course again next, next spring, you know, so please do that and also sign up for the reunion if you're interested. But now let's recap. So we have 40 lectures to go through. That's a lot. So lecture one, and this will be fast. And if you have questions, just interrupt, all right? So lecture one, we learned about the landscape for biomedical signal and image processing here in Boston. MGH is, um, has a billion dollars or more of research programs, so largest in the world. Brigham and Women's is another one, part of Harvard Medical School, ton of hospitals, ton of uh, biotech companies in Boston. Um, and this course is supposed to prepare you for a career in this field, right? So lecture two, we talked about analog signals, which are the real world signals. They're continuous, the infinite accuracy and infinite measurements. And um, examples are these kind of analog sensors, but then we also have digital sensors. So a digital signal is a discrete signal with limited accuracy and limited measurements. And all these sensors have a component, which is this ADC, the analog to digital converter, where you give the analog signal in and get the, the digital discrete signal out. And this converter always comes with some distortions, for instance, sampling limitations and noise. And then we talked about uh, yeah, different sampling rates. If you have the analog wave on the left and then choose how to sample it, different points, the higher you sample, the more accurate representation you get, right? But it's also a trade-off because you need to store more information, the more sample points you have. Then we talked about the Nyquist-Shannon theorem, where it says to avoid aliasing, we need to sample with a frequency that is larger than twice the maximum signal frequency. And, and what does that mean? That usually in the real world, we use machines to determine that, or you can do for your analysis. And we talked a little bit about that later. Then we calculate the sample rate as an example. And then we said, how is the data represented? It's an array, right? For these 1D signals, it's an array. And why is it called 1D? Because it's time on the x-axis. Lecture three, 
first journal club. We talked about the intro to research about um, careers in academia versus industry. And um, yeah, then lecture four, we started looking into the Fourier analysis, which essentially as a takeaway, just remember you can decompose any signal to a harmonic signal components, which then appear on a frequency spectrum, on this power spectrum of the Fourier um, transformation, you get this frequency domain. And then we talked a little bit about noise. Noise in any signals or images is usually high frequency. Uh, there's a 60 Hertz noise, which comes from the electric power outlets. Lecture five, we started with ECG. And ECG was the first model we talked about. It measures um, this QRS complex, right? Or PQRST complex. And um, it measures this with, for instance, this 12 uh, lead ECG. Now, later we talked about Apple Watch, which has the, where you connect and have like, I think it's a two lead uh, ECG. But um, the point is you can see based on the measurements whether the heart is uh, healthy or not. And this is also, you can see heart attacks on the ECG. And um, yeah, that was our first modality. And then we, in lecture six, we talked about how to read a paper. We started talking about how to read a paper. So another journal club. And then in lecture seven, we had these two experts come in from Philips Healthcare talking about their work on ECG. And that was very interesting um, because they do nothing else but work on algorithms for ECG data. And then as part of um, this whole ECG topic, we also had assignment one where you use this, um, this um, what was it again, the, the package we used? Um, NK NeuroKit or something? No, NeuroKit doesn't make sense. I don't know, I don't remember, NeuroKit 2 maybe? I don't remember fully, but you can, uh, you had a signal, an ECG, real ECG signal, and then analyze the peaks and use some algorithms to process that. And this also involved some NumPy. So we did a little one-on-one uh, -on, -one on NumPy slicing and array indexing there as well. Lecture nine was the virtual field trip at the symposium, the neuroimaging symposium from MGH, where for instance, Lorraine gave this excellent presentation about her fiber stars work. And then lecture 10, we continued with the modalities and this was EEG, you know, the electroencephalogram, which allows you to measure brain activity. Um, and also we uh, a little bit mentioned MEG, which is the magnetoencephalography. And then later in the journal club, we actually talked about MEG a little bit more. So EEG was invented by this, this person, Hans Berger, who measured the activity while her, his daughter was doing math. And then when it was more complicated problems, he saw more activity, which is very fascinating if you think about it. The, the thing is, if you have this, um, these electrodes on top, outside of your head, right, not the neural link, outside of your head, then you can't really know which region gives you the activity. So that's a limitation of EEG. It cannot reveal from which brain stru structure the activity comes from. For this, you would need fMRI, which we'll talk about it later, right? Uh, we learned about this 1020 system to place the electrodes, which is just the, um, the distance between the electrons in percentage. And they usually use 25 to 256 electrodes. I think the neural link, this monkey video we shared, I shared on the slide, um, has 2000 electrodes implanted. So then we talked about these different brain waves, uh, which are associated with different cognitive functions. Oh yeah, and EEG is also used for research in terms of evoked potentials, right? You can put a sound on the ear and then measure whether the brain reacts to it, or you can, uh, you can measure how the brain reacts to visual stimuli or uh, um, a touch stimuli, somatosensory, like on the skin, right? On, uh, yeah, that's the first time I mentioned this neural link, but there are also other startups which um, work uh, in this direction and not with implants, but outside. For instance, this one, I forgot the name, but then we, we learned about the MNE package and this was then for, I think for assignment two, we used the MNE package. Now in lecture 11, journal, another journal club, how to read and write a paper. We started with that. And here are the notes we had. And uh, 
Yeah, we talked about so so there's so many papers out there. You can never read them all. So it's really uh, the the skill you need to develop is to how to efficiently read a paper rather than like skimming the paper, right? So there's this how to read a paper. First, read the abstract to get the outline of the story. Look at the images. That's how I do it, right? Look at browse the images, read the caption of the images. That should also underline the story if it's a good written paper. And then at the end, read the conclusions and then go in the in the center and look for the details you want to know, right? We, we, we did this technique for some of these papers like Dojo, the proofreading paper, talked about other stuff like state of the art reports, which are special types of papers like review papers. Um, uh, we talked about reviewing papers that like peer review, right? This process of accepting research. Okay, then in lecture 12, we move to 2D signals, which are images. And similar to 1D signals, it's all numbers. And then we learned a little bit about pixels here in the grayscale case. They usually have uh, values from 0 to 255. And then we also spoke about the uh, frequency in images. While we already learned about uh, for year a little bit, we did some experiments too with the 1D signals in images. Low frequency components means no ch no drastic changes in the in the intensity, while high frequency changes um, are drastic, like edges, for instance. Here's a high frequency change, while here's a low frequency change on this watermelon. Then for our, for color images, we have multiple channels instead of only one, so RGB or RGBA, which adds this um, transparency. And one thing you need to remember, besides it's all numbers, you need to figure out the conventions. So here, when we look at this, sometimes the first channel is R and then GB, and sometimes it's opposite. The first channel is B and the, the last channel is R, right? That's, there was, I think, OpenCV versus Mahotas. Um, in this context, we talked about this uh, Lena image, which um, like they are, uh, yeah, in the community, we should not use that anymore because it's uh, it's it's um, yeah it, it was never intended to be used as a testing image and um, the the model Lena actually was not aware of all of this and um, didn't want the, doesn't want it so there are efforts to not use this Lena image anymore for uh, experiments so please don't do that. Then we talked about image filtering. We always have an input image and then a kernel, which we move over the image to get an output image. That's a simple filtering with kernels. And the mathematical operation is um, essentially element-wise multiplication and then addition to get the new pixel values. So you move this filter mask over the image and get then the new pixel values. One project I'm working on has the numbers encoded as 32 bit ints, which are ordered RGBA, but because they're a little Indian, they're actually ABGR if you look at the bytes, super annoying to deal with. Yeah, and in this context, um, uh, WebGL, for instance, if you want to render something, uh, has a limitation either 8 bit or 16 bit. And for connectomics, we have this, these huge IDs, right, for the label maps, which are 32-bit or 64-bit. So we also had to then add multiple textures and then process them in a, uh, in a way to remap that to a 64-bit um, integer. So that sounds very similar to the problem you mentioned, Paul. Okay, so... Uh, then we learned about thresholding, where you clamp out or mask out certain intensity values here, for instance, the SpongeBob image, if we say um, only show stuff above 200 is the bright elements. And uh, yeah, everything below 200 is set to zero, then an image like this comes out. If you would just go for the very bright images, you go like this. And this is very related to the histogram, which always works th that you have the color or the intensity on the X axis, and then the number of pixels on the Y axis. So you can see that if you would clamp here and set everything on the left to the to the um, to zero. Then you only have these spikes here, and this ma matches, um, yeah, roughly this or this image. You know, so that's another way of looking at the at the data with a histogram, which is useful if you have a new image to first get a feeling what kind of thresholding can work, maybe. 
So this is used to create segmentations, right? And here's an example of a tumor segmentation. Now, maybe, th does anybody have an idea what kind of modality this probably is? This brain scan. Any guesses? Pectospect, I think it's too high res for pectospect. Uh, so I would say, I, actually, I don't know the answer, but it could also be a T2 MRI based on the white and gray matter colors, but I'm not, I'm not sure actually, maybe, maybe it's a CAT scan, but the point is you see the tumor very well and you see, and in PET on spec, you do see tumors very well, as you know, from assignment seven, but then you can do thresholding to get this tumor out. And sometimes you have segmentations um, or labels of uh, multiple labels. So you want to uh, parcelate this brain, then you create this label map. You know? Automatic segmentation is a hard problem, uh, as we also seen later in the deep learning assignment and um, for the mitochondria, right? So the semi-automatic segmentation where user places seed, seeds usually gives a little better results because you constrain the problem, right? Now in lecture 13, we said um, that manual segmentations or expert segmentations are usually performed to have a ground truth, um, like a baseline for evaluating segmentation techniques. And these are very time consuming, like here, remember this, two people work for six months to label this cylinder. And then there are also things like the atlas-based segmentation where you have a subject and then you have a labeled atlas. So what you do then to create, to, to segment a subject, you, you register or align the subject, the individual subject to the atlas. And then you can also transfer the label map over, align the label map, and then it matches and you get the segmentation for the subject. There's atlas-based segmentation, which introduced the registration for us Registration means mapping one subject to a standard space. So segmentation, registration are very important content, uh, concepts in uh, biomedical imaging. Here, for instance, because there are so many uh, different, uh, the, like if you want to um, have a standard head image, then the, the, uh, every person has a different head. The variability is very high. So you need to bring them in a normalized space um, to compare them properly. Oh yeah, we did some more experiments on the collab where we looked at signals and um, stuff like that. Lecture 14, reading and writing papers continued in the journal club. And we said, um, oh yeah, that the conferences usually come with their own LaTeX templates on Overleaf, for instance. Um, there's, we talked about the author order when it comes to papers. The first author is usually the person who does the most work. This, the last author is usually the supervising um, professor and only in computer science theory it's different in alphabetical order which is interesting right so then um, a usual outline for papers intro related work method evaluation discussion and results and then conclusions and future work so when i write a paper i first create the outline then add the figures then create bullets and then stretch the bullets to paragraphs and i think that's a good good way of um, starting uh, to, to make the, the whole paper body. So lecture 15, we talked, um, oh, it's visual, it was visualization. So we said, okay, there are 2D imaging modalities and also 3D ones. So the 2D ones give us 2D images and the 3D ones give us image volumes, which you have to slice this and then you can do volume rendering. And then we looked at slice drop where you have the re-sliced, um, uh, yeah, the planes of the, the volume and compare 2D versus 3D visualizations. Same for label maps. If you have label maps, you can use the marching cubes algorithm to create these 3D meshes. You could also do volume rendering of the label map, but what people usually do is for from label maps, you do the create a 3D mesh because the label map is um, one value. The whole thing is one value usually. Like so one label is one value. So you don't have this um these shading things which you have with imaging uh, image volumes 
slice-based volume rendering works that you slice the 3D array in one direction, put all the slices together and blend them. And you can do that in all three directions. That's what slice drop does, right? We looked at the, the slices in slice drop. But there's another technique called ray casting, where you shoot rays through the volume and then calculate the intersection along the volume and then map that down to an intensity value. And you can get very, very pretty pictures with the ray casting, like here, this, this uh, brain, which is also rendered in WebGL. So this is WebGL 2, because in WebGL 1, you didn't have the 3D textures. That's why Slice Drop had to switch between these different um, reslicing methods, while this one has a 3D texture, and then you have all the data on the shaders already. Lecture 16, Steve Piper came in talking about 3D Slicer. And that was the first time we uh, um, yeah, learned about 3D Slicer. Followed up with a Lecture 17 Journal Club, more on the signal processing side of things. For instance, this ASCII encoding of, uh, for uh, using of biomedical signals while transferred using SMS. And then we also talked about EEG and psychiatric disorders. And Lecture 18, then start with assignment three, where we use 3D slicer and some uh, 3D ultrasound and do some reconstruction, some manual segmentation, some rendering. And 3D slicer is a processing framework. And we talked about processing frameworks here, which uh, always have data management, visualization, registration, segmentation, and analysis components. In this context, we talked a little bit about the differences between MATLAB and Python, which is the indexing starts at one for MATLAB, right? Which is dangerous when it comes to um, uh, image processing algorithms, because if you're off one voxel, could be that you're off one millimeter if you have an MRI with one millimeter voxel size, which is not accurate and not, uh, yeah, it can be dangerous. When it, for processing frames, it's important who they target as the user. Doctors will not do um, terminal stuff or coding usually, you know, that's what scientists usually do. So there's a spectrum in between. And then later we heard also from Rudolf about this these different um, use, uh, target users and uh, how he bridges from terminal to clinical application using the CRISP platform. Lecture 17, uh, 19 was ultrasound. We have these um, high frequency waves, which uh, we can't hear as humans. And ultrasound is usually uh, a very, it's very common for um, uh, in pregnancy, during pregnancy to see the baby. Standard ultrasound is this 2D brightness mode, right? The B mode. Then we talked about how the the waves, um, oh yeah, get reflected. So you use some jelly, petroleum jelly, to have a better transmission to the tissue. And also then, yeah, waves get absorbed, waves get refracted, and um, waves get reflected. So ultrasound is very good to detect the needle, for instance, because the reflection goes straight back to the sensor, to the probe. And there's one thing, since ultrasound was our first imaging um, technique, different tissues have different properties. So bone, for instance, absorbs ultrasound. So we can't really see tissue with the ultrasound behind bones. And this concept of different tissues have different properties for the imaging modality is valid for all imaging modalities, right? Yeah, those are the ultrasound modes, A, B mode. B mode is the standard, the traditional ultrasound. Then we also talked about the 3D ultrasound and what it looks like. Lecture 20 was another journal club. This time we talked about MEG and the ultrasound toolbox. And then Rudolf came in um, from Boston Children's Hospital talking about this gap, right, between clinicians and scientists and how to bridge it. Lecture 22 was x-ray. Um, and x-rays have a higher resolution, no, a roughly high resolution, 0 0.1 millimeter per pixel. So x-rays can be 2K by 2K. We talked a little bit about the history, about the risk of x-rays. So there is radiation exposure, right? And we talked about these markers they use to orient the x-ray properly. So here's a little, they, they scan that as well. There's an L for left. So this is the left shoulder of the patient. Lecture 23, another journal club. We talked about the multi-scale vessel enhancement filtering. One of my favorite classic papers from Frangi. Very useful algorithm because 
without any user interaction besides setting some parameters. So you don't click in the image, but you can highlight tubes, blobs, or plate-like structures in the image. Then we also talked about the fast grow cut, which is a segmentation method, a semi-automatic one. You place a seed, right? And then it grows um, to the boundaries. These are very common and good papers to know about. Lecture 24 was microscopy. Now, X-ray was 0.1 millimeters. Microscopy goes to micrometers and nanometer resolution. And we have the, um, the optical microscopy where images look like this, a little bit less resolution than the electron microscopy, where you can really see uh, images with extremely high resolution, like factor 100K uh, magnifying to 5 million. And they use electron waves instead of visible light. And this can penetrate the objects very deep. And electron microscopes are very much used for the field of connectomics which I think is the one of the most exciting research areas right now because it's um, uh, yeah, looking at the brain and trying to understand the brain. Remember, we take these mice or cut out human data, slice up the brain real thin, and then scan it with this electron microscope to get images like this, where you really see the intracellular structures. Those little circles are vesicles, which um, are used to do synaptic connections. So here, this data is four nanometers per pixel. And the green lines are the membranes of the cells. So that's the first step in the connectomics pipeline to create a label map for all the cells, all the membranes. Um, and this is already a very hard problem. And recently, the Allen Brain Institute, together with Princeton University, created the first millimeter cube of brain tissue um, fully uh, segmented and uh, fully scanned. And then they, now they're working on the segmentation, or I guess, yeah, handed it off to Princeton. So they're still working on the segmentation, I guess. But the images itself, it's a 3D data set of two petabyte. This is huge. Lecture 25, we had KK come in, who actually worked on connectomics as a biologist before and now is a data scientist. So he talked a little bit about his research um, of the neuromuscular junction, which was very interesting because he used different modalities for different ages of the mouse. Lecture 26, another journal club. Here we had um, connectomics papers, actually, merge error correction for neurons. And... Uh, um, this cell paper from 2015, uh, where we actually have the cylinder, which we looked at, where the, those two people worked for six months on it, is now public data. This is a very important paper because there were a lot of insights based on this um, tissue, biological insights, also computer science insights. So this data is available. All the insights are available. So people refer to this uh, uh, fairly often. Lecture 27. Assignment four was um, due, which was x-ray data, right? Pneumonia versus normal scans based on the Kaggle data set. And um, we used the random forest algorithm to classify them. We spoke about x-ray before, but now we switch to 3D x-ray, which is also called CAT scans or CT. Um, and here's a scanner, it's like the donut scanner. And the data you get out is a 3D array because it really is rotating X-ray, X-ray from different angles. So you can re-slice the 3D array along these actual coronal and sagittal slices. That's something you can do with all 3D images. And uh, we talked about the voxel size for CAT scans is 0.6 to 1.25 millimeter. And it's, it's very similar to MRI. The, the special thing is, and here again, different in tissues, different intensities. That's with all imaging modalities. But for CT or CAT scans, the Hounsfield units are important because it's, uh, it's a normalized range for different tissue types. It's never accurate, you know, as we also seen in the next assignment, but um, it's, it's more standardized than MRI data by using this, uh, this this scale of minus 1,000 to 1,000. And then we talked about, wait a minute, the images have only 256 different intensity values. And 
in this context, we talked about window leveling to map this scale to different um, uh, ranges of the Hounsfield units to create different images. For instance, here, window leveling is optimized for soft tissue. So with window leveling, you always have a window you move around, and a level you move around, and then the window, how large you make a, um, a, a, like a range of this window, which you then map to this range of 0 to 255. And that's how you can see different things in the CAT scan. So for instance, bone is very high value, so you would move the, the window level to a high high value to see the bones. This one is for soft tissue, which is um, in the center, right? 40 to 80 is soft tissue. So this window level shows the soft tissue. Uh, of course, there's since we have multiple x-rays taken, essentially multiple x-rays during a, a CAT scan, there, there's a higher risk um, the, in the head CAT scan than a head x-ray. Like in fact, um, yeah, 10 times higher uh, or more, like 20 times higher. So, um, and they say there's a risk of one out of 2,000 that you can get cancer from a CAT scan. So you shouldn't do that every day. We talked also about COVID CAT scans where you see these lung uh, nodules. This, uh, it's called the ground glass. It looks like ground glass on the images which they use for diagnosing the, the COVID. Um, we talked about artifacts from me uh, metal, like in the uh, dental artifacts, or if you, um, it's this contrast artifact, I guess. I don't know if the contrast made an artifact here or if there's some piece of metal also in the body. But yeah, you can put contrast agent into the patient before scanning. Lecture 28, assignment five was this CAT scan assignment. And then we switch to maybe the most popular imaging modality these days is MRI because it does not expose you to radiation, right? Instead, you have a magnet, which is extremely powerful. And there are 1.5 Tesla scanners, three Tesla scanners, seven Tesla scanners, or sometimes now 10 Tesla scanners. And uh, three Tesla, it has a magnetic field, which is 60,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And this magnet is always on. So that's something you should remember when you enter an MRI room, a safety room, they usually screen you for metal objects. Um, the seven Tesla cost $6.5 million. They use coils to increase the signal noise ratio to enhance the contrast uh, during MRI scans. The voxel size, um, yeah, it can be for MRI from, from 0 0.1 to 1 millimeter. And the, there are three components actually in the MRI scan. There's the magnet, which, um, yeah, like uh, has a magnetic field. Then there's a re radio frequency, which is the resonance, which stimulates the atoms of the body. And then there's the gradient coil, which splits this electromagnetic field into different sections to get the, um, the spatial orientation. And based on this process, we talked a little bit about it, but what you could remember is there are two ways of um, adjusting the MRI signal, and that's the echo time and the repetition time. And people program these MRI scanners, the MRI sequences, with different impulses for the, and different times to create different images. For instance, T1 weighted, T2 weighted, and flare. Now, if I look at this, I think, yes, at the beginning, the tumor one looks more like a, a T2 weighted MRI scan. You know, um, yeah, they have different intensity values. And they are based on these different echo time and repetition time. They are also, um, oh yeah, then you see the different tissue types. Of course, the imaging modalities always show the different tissue types differently. Um, and depending on how you set up these times, you get these different um, tissue types. So, that's why I said is a T2, the white matter actually appeared dark gray. Could also be a flare sequence, I guess. There's not much difference between flare and T2 weighted images. Besides the CSF, the, the spinal fluid, which um, appears bright. So we would have to go back to decide whether it's T2 or flare. 
Anyways, there's also diffusion weighted imaging and DTI, the, the fibers we talked about in the Journal Club recently, to create this area level connectivity map. fMRI allows you to see uh, localized brain activity. And I mentioned this experiment with this, um, with this dead salmon where the fMRI machine still highlighted some activity in the dead salmon. So both DTI, DWI, and fMRI, they're all approximations, you know? So they are considered scientific, of course, you know, but it's a model we impose there. We don't really know what's happening um, and how it really matches the reality, all right? So don't tell that the researchers who use that uh, or develop algorithms for it. But like, yeah, you got to the structural MRI. We we know it's more solid than these two. Let's say it like that. Then we also have the um, MRA, which is the angiography, where you see the, uh, the vessels like aneurysms or stenosis clogged up vessels using the MRI scanner. For, <clears throat> excuse me, for MRI, <clears throat> For MRI, you can also put the contrast agent in to highlight tumors, for instance, right? Or blood vessels. So what's the difference between MRI and uh, CAT scan? So MRI is more expensive, takes longer, but has a better contrast and is super noisy. So you need headphones when you go in there. The CAT scan is also noisy, but not that much. And um, it's cheaper and faster, but also higher risk, right? Because MRI has no risk in terms of radiation, zero, but any uh, of these things can do a risk because of the strong magnet. And we also looked at images like this, which can be funny, but it's also very dangerous. People died by uh, not following the protocols for the, um, the ma ma uh, magnet safe rooms, right? Lecture 29 was another journal club. We talked about the mouse visual system with the functional hierarchy, and then also different parcellation methods for the human cerebral cortex, which means how to group the cortex, how to segment it differently. Lecture 30 was Tina Kapoor. She came in, talked about the Amigo Suite, which is fascinating. So that's just a, a great operating room here in Boston at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And um, uh, I, yeah, I found it very interesting. I didn't know all the details she, she presented and one thing was so interesting was this template, right? If they want to scan the patient, they have this cardboard template to make sure the patient is in the right position for the donor to move over. Very expensive uh, equipment. And um, yeah, we're lucky to have it here in the city. Lecture 31, we started talking about deep learning, which is a, um, a subfield of machine learning, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence. We said deep learning is everywhere. And there's still this gap between natural and artificial intelligence, which is a very broad gap. And we talked about supervised learning specifically, which we also did using this random forest in assignment four. Supervised learning is we tell the algorithm what is what with labels and then measure the loss after the prediction um, of the algorithm. We mentioned the UNET, which we then later use in assignment, right? Because the UNET is a very popular algorithm to create a segmentation for an image. Then we replaced, we started replacing the random forest with a deep neural net with mixed results at first. But for sure, we learned about these four steps, which you always need to do when it comes to machine learning or specifically um, deep learning. You load the data, you set up the network, you train the network, you predict. And when you load the data, you need to make sure to have training and testing data separate. It's very important. All machine learning algorithms need that. You know? So you can't test on the same data you train with. That would be unfair. It would um, not show any generalization ability of the algorithm. And you set up the network uh, with Keras. You can do it just with a few lines to so set up this classic Linet 5-like architecture. Then during training phase, you give the training data, the full set of training data, tell for each image of the training data what it is. And that's uh, this full, full thing is called an epic. And then you check after each epic how well the network predicted on 
let's say not the testing data, but a different set, usually the validation data. And then the loss should go down after each epic. And during prediction, then you really test the, the testing data and don't tell the network what the testing data is and then compare the answers. And hopefully it matches because you want to measure how well the CNN does. Lecture 32 was then um, another journal club where we talked about these um, uh, at brain atlases. So there was the brain atlas of 2020 Chinese adults, which was um, very interesting and uh, important. And because um, the, yeah, the, the head shape is um, different in different places on the world, right? And um, if you don't have atlases which match these, these different uh, head shapes, then they are not really usable. So it's another bias in the imaging um, domain we have to um, counter. Now, then we talked about the automatic segmentation without an atlas in this paper. And I forgot a little bit of the details, but um, yeah, I think it was a important paper. Does anybody remember what this paper said? Anybody of the presenting people remember what the paper said? <laughs> Let's just uh, shall I pull it pull it up. What well, doesn't matter? Let's just move on. Let's just move on. We can go, always go back. You can go back to lecture thirty two, and then you have the link to the paper, and then pull it pull it up. Lecture thirty three assignment six was due, which was the deep learning assignment, right? Where we um, ran an automatic segmentation of the mitochondria data, and here we spoke about classification versus regression. In classification, you put stuff into classes, into these buckets. For instance, for MNIST, these 10 numbers. For mitochondria, it was foreground and background, those two buckets, right? Versus regression, where you estimate values or fit a curve to something. So here's classification, here's regression. Then we also talked about GANs, where there's this combination of generator and discriminator to tune an input of noise to match real images. You know, that's a very important architecture, very famous by Ian Goodfellow, who's a superstar in the artificial neural network world. Then we also talked about autoencoders. Autoencoders always have an input and try to restore the input as good as possible while compressing the image. So in the center, it goes always down, goes back up, similar to the unit, a little bit. The unit is similar, but the, the compressed representation is what's so important here because with that, you can do all kinds of processing more efficiently if you don't need to load the whole image to do processing, but work with the latent space, the smaller representation, uh, you have, um, yeah, the, the computation time is cut by a huge factor. Then we succeeded using the deep neural network for assignment four by tuning the epics and then doing some data augmentation, right? Horizontal flip, vertical flip. Lecture 34 we started talking about nuclear imaging. And nuclear imaging always works that um, uh, we track a path of a radioactive trace. And there are two types, the SPECT and PET. And the different, they're very similar. The images look very similar, but they're different types of radio tracers for these two. And there's also cost difference and so on. But um, yeah, both of them allow you to see normal and abnormal activity in the living tissue. So. Both of them take have a carrier, which is bound to a radioactive atom, which gets injected to the patient and then binds to somewhere to protein or sugar in the body, for instance, can bind to tumor site. And then you can um, detect the tumor nicely on the image by map uh, by um, measuring the radioactivity. So the different spec uses gamma rays, PET uses positron imaging, and both have a very low resolution. So low resolution means five to 10 millimeters per um, voxel or pixel, rather than to the higher resolution of CAT and MRI. That's why you pair them often with a structural scan. So here in the structural scan, you don't see the tumor, 
but if you overlay the pet image, then you see the tumor. Lecture 35 is um, the unit, um, yeah, we're unit in the journal club. So it was a regular unit paper by Ronneberg, a very classic paper, 2015, um, important work, very often cited. Um, and then there was this new one from this year, the NN unit, which is self-configuring and then reached this incredible performances on a bunch of uh, biomedical imaging benchmarks. Lecture 36, assignment 7 came out. Thanks again for submitting it. And we talked about biometrics, which means unique human identifiers for personal identification. There are a ton of different features you can use, like fingerprints, um, the iris, the, the heartbeat, the voice, the ear shape, and so on. But the usual pipeline involves segmentation because you extract some features in the acquired image or signal. Then you align or register this um, with a template database, and then you classify based on this information. So this pipeline is always the same or very similar for all biometric uh, classifiers. And of course, it's all numbers. And that's why you can use uh, the um, imaging or signal processing libraries we learned about in this course also for in the field of biometric. We quickly tried the space detection using a pre-trained model using OpenCV that worked pretty well. Lecture 37, we talked about the future, and I said future in the biomedical domain um, involves AR, VR, XR, AI, wearables and devices for AR, VR, XR. We talked about um, training using these headsets, uh, augmented surgery, giving additional information to the, to the physician doing surgery. Then what's this communication telemedicine? Yeah, you get, uh, especially in rural areas in the world, you can get feedback or data from um, other side, sites. Then um, simulations, you know, just to try stuff out on a virtual patient. Artificial intelligence, very booming market still, and also in the next few years, Google is involved, Star startups are involved, and um, they, uh, they show usually in um, or like their, their goal is always to outperform the radiologist or the clinician um, either with a combination of human and AI, AI so the augmented intelligence or with an automatic method but before you can use them in the daily work of in the hospital it needs to be FDA approved which is a process which takes years so I think augmented intelligence the combination of human and AI actually has the most uh, future and potential right now because you have uh, the the best of both worlds you have the human expert and then you have the ai which screens a ton of data and points the user in the right direction then we talked about wearables and devices for instance the apple watch for the ecg ekg this mri glove which was interesting because it's a portable mri scanner and nanobots which are up and coming nothing really in the um, active yet all research. 3D bioprinting, same thing. Research right now, very fascinating. You, you 3D print tissue from uh, the human tissue, living tissue. Then cybernetics and body hacking, freaky field and mRNA coronavirus vaccines, which allow you to code the immune system. So the mRNA vaccines have potential also for ca cancer and so on. But in all cases, whenever we talk about any like this, for us computer scientists, this is all numbers. So this is something, this is maybe the main takeaway of this course. Here we had one more journal club where we talked about DTI and biometrics in the era of COVID-19. And then lecture 39, the Ask Me Anything on Monday. So I had a great time. Thank you very much for the semester. It was the first time this course uh, I taught this course or this course even existed here at UMass Boston. So um, yeah, I think it should give you a nice overview of what's out there for the biomedical signal and image processing field. And I hope that you are interested in uh, working in the field. And I think if you apply locally and mention that you took this course and some people know me here in the, in the field, you know, and if you show the syllabus or talk about the syllabus, then you might have good chances to land a job. So with that, thank you very much for this um, good semester. Thank you for all the performance in the journal club and in the assignment. And uh, yeah, don't forget the mega quiz and all the missing grades will come.
And with that, um, give me feedback one more time. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's a great field to be in because you really have something where you use computer science to something that helps people. All right. Don't forget the, um, if you like the course, don't forget the evals, cs480.org slash evals. And then I might be able to teach it again next spring. All right. Well, thanks again. And everybody have a nice day. Any questions, let me know via email. Let's stay in touch. Bye now.